Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Children. Objective 1. Public Education. Public education had its foundation in this country prior to the revolution. It has been held that an educated citizenry would be watchful of abuses by government. The concept, as implemented and conducted for over a century, was that local school boards raised revenue through ad valerium taxes, determined curriculum based upon the needs of the community, provided facilities for the purpose of education, received all of Section 16, that being one square mile in each township surveyed under the rectangular survey system in the western lands. This was the only participation by the federal government until the 1950s, and hired teachers to provide an education to the students. As time went on, the federal government created a new cabinet position and administrative agency for health, education, and welfare. Over a few decades, nearly all of the authority for the above-listed responsibilities devolved to absolute control by the federal government. The problem is that an administrative agency has displaced community, county, state, and family from the determination of what their children will be taught. They have controlled who may teach, what material can be used to teach, and extended their control to matters outside the realm of education, such as social engineering and value-based education instead of the moral-based education we once received. Objective 2. Homeschooling. Public education was historically made available. This left the parents of children to decide whether they want to allow their children to attend public school, be taught at home, homeschooling, or receive no formal education at all. The state stepped in first to make education mandatory with truant officers. Now, many states have imposed their guidelines on what qualifications, what material, and what guidelines parents must adhere to if they choose to educate their own children. The problem is that state and federal administrative agencies have removed much of the responsibility that God gave to the parents with regard to the rearing of their children so that they can be indoctrinated in the ways of the government's choosing. Objective 3. Child Protective Services Every state has, under suggestion or pressure from the rebel U.S. government, established a Child Protective Service or equivalent. Though the name sounds good, in fact the agency, supported by federal funding, has the right to determine whether you are a fit parent or not. Spare the rod and spoil the child has become criminal when applied to disciplining your child. CPS can seize your children without due process of law and then place them where they see fit. It is likely that some of these agencies have even found that putting children out of adoption can be profitable, 
beyond the already lucrative government funding. The problem is that the government, Congress, and administrative agencies in Washington, D.C. have funded and encouraged the establishment of agencies within the states who are legally required to determine if you are a fit parent or not. This has been destructive of traditional family values, upheld in this country for centuries, and has put the state as parent under color of law of all children. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it, each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually, to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms, or defeat by failure 
to be willing to fully commit to the cause.